35 civilians killed in Burkina Faso attack. Five Mozambicans frozen as the hardest set 13 houses on fire. Plus. Stands by the hand of the pledge to restore civilian rule to the country within two years. Thanks for joining us for the program. I'm Tokyo Rogers. We begin today in Burkina Faso, where at least 35 civilians have been killed by a bomb that hit a convoy of vehicles in the northern region of the country where jihadist rebels are active. Authorities say dozens of others were wounded in the blast on the road between Jibo and Buzanga. Convoys escorted by Burkina Faso's army are used to deliver supplies to towns that are otherwise cut off by the jihadists. Civilian casualties and jihadist attacks have increased since the military seized power in Burkina Faso in January. Burkina Faso has been grappling with the jihadist insurgency that swept in from neighboring Mali in 2015. More than 2,000 people have died and some 1.9 million people have been forced to leave their homes. Meanwhile, five youths posing as jihadists set fire to 13 houses in a village in the jihadist hit northern Mozambique province of Cabo Delgado. According to authorities, the young men pretended to be jihadists so as to steal from the locals. The provincial police commander, Vicente Chicote, says one of the men was identified and seized by the local population and is currently under police attention. He said it was not the first time young people in the area had posed as jihadists with an intention to steal within the communities. Let's bring in our security experts, Timitope Olodo. Uh, he joins us virtually from Kent in England. Hello, Timitope. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Right, so Burkina Faso has been struggling with jihadist insurgency, killing thousands and forcing uh, millions to flee their homes. What do you think is lagging in terms of security measures in the country? I think what is lagging in, in, in Burkina Faso, like every other African country, is a lack of a proper plan. Since the military has taken over, the jihadists seem to have been emboldened you know, to attack them. More than two million people have been displaced, similar to the situation in Nigeria. And it's all across the Sahel because we know, and we've always said it, that when there is insecurity in the region, it always affects you know, the country, you know, the countries around them. And that's the reason why having that joint, model, joint national tax force working with other countries around you to stem the violent extremism happening in those countries that could fuel or influence activities in your country is one of the major aspects, one of the ways to deal with it. We should understand the, the world is going through a lot of crisis currently because of the, you know, problem in Ukraine, you know, problem of living costs. So there's a lot of drivers of violence extremism that is going on. And government needs to focus on trying to win the heart of mind of people within their country to make sure that they do not become too vulnerable for the others group to take advantage of them. And if government are effective in engaging with the community, you'll find out that this kind of violence extremism will be reduced, you know. Uh, unfortunately, Burkina Faso is going through this similar phase that Nigeria went through, where they had now we have more than five bomb incidents this year alone. You know, two million people displaced. This is a lot of individuals, and I think it is high time that all these African countries start to speak to, to each other and find out best practices that is happening across the region and find how they could work together to deal with these jihadist challenges. Well, it appears that there is, seems to be a pattern of violence in the Sahel region. Uh, they seem to be targeting civilians, which you know, most of them do, even with the Boko Haram insurgency here in Nigeria. What basically is behind the, uh, the drive behind this? I, I, th I think one of the challenges that most of those jihadists face is that they, are, they have this extreme view of, of the religion of Islam, which 
Of course, it's not what the general population of people that are practicing that religion believes in. And when there is that conflict, they tend to go after the people who will not agree with their own ideology. And we have seen that sometimes they become very suspicious of the people on ground. So one of the ways to put fear in the people is actually to go after the people and show them that, yes, we can attack you, we can do whatever we want to do to you, and there is nobody to come to your aid. You cannot imagine me in Kent now being terrorized to pay tax, and then I'll be paying tax to a terrorist, and the UK government will not actually come in there and deal with it, putting the flag down and ensuring they deal with it. But in our situation, we have a situation in Africa where, you know, all these incidents, 35 people killed, that does not stop the party going on in the presidential villa in Burkina Faso. You know, it, it just shows you that, you know, we, we, we misplace our priority if we are really serious about helping people. And when people see that government is actually coming to their aid, you find out that people will be emboldened to say, you know what, we're going to face up to these people. Because how many are these jihadists? They're not up to a million, you know, for God's sake. But yet they are terrorizing millions of people. Two million people have been displaced. So government needs to empower its people, need to, need to make sure that they are showing them that they have strong institutions on ground to ensure they stamp this issue and deal with people that might become vulnerable. Help those people that might become vulnerable to violent extremism and bring them back from that break, that break that they are about to enter into. I think if government should do that with the other interventions, we'll be able to stem this growth, violent growth of violence extremism across the side that is really affecting the life of a lot of people in the West African region. Right, so finally, let me just put this to you. Of course, in Burkina Faso, the military seized power in January. Uh, the plan is, you know, to make things right and hand over in two years, I believe. Do you think this will solve the security problem or do you think it's too deep to resolve so quick, quickly? Well, once you open the door to terrorism, it's always very, very difficult to deal with it. There are certain types of terrorism that you could deal with. Things like the Niger that are aware, okay, you give them what they want. We found out even in Nigeria where they said, oh, they wanted President Buhari at one point to be the person that negotiated on their behalf. They said Jonathan will have to combat to become a Muslim. But we've seen them killing Muslims. More Muslims have been killed by the jihadists than Christians. So these guys do not believe in the faith which they are using as a tool for the, uh, for the activity or atrocity they are committing. The good thing is that good people need to come together. All the people in Burkina Faso, both the stakeholders, all the different stakeholders, need to come together and know that they have to fight this enemy, which is this jihadism that is actually affecting their livelihood and their life generally. And then stamp it. Once they stamp it, then we could go back because it's only the ministry that actually has the most to deal with these things. And if the ministry is not getting the support of the politicians on ground, then it's going to become very, very difficult to be able to address this issue. And no, this might prolong because no, if anybody says they're going to deal with terrorism, it takes roughly at least about 20 years to be able to stamp terrorism out. So the, all the good people need to put their hands together to deal with this menace that we're dealing with. Right, thank you, Timito Pemos. Thank you for your time on Network Africa today. Thank you very much for having me. We're saying in Burkina Faso, where the military ruler, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henri Damiba, says he will honor a promise to restore civilian rule within two years. Under the 24 month transition agreement struck in July with the West Africa Regional Bloc ECOWAS, the military rulers pledged to hold elections that will return the country to civilian rule. Lieutenant Colonel Damiba on Monday visited President Alassane Ouattara of neighboring Ivory Coast, a diplomatic foray that became on the heels of a visit to Mali on Saturday. The three countries are battling a bloody campaign by Islamist groups in the Sahel that has worsened the security situation. Lieutenant Colonel Damiba and President Batara discussed the future of Burkina Faso and the security situation in the region. During the meeting, the two leaders praised efforts against jihadist groups and the collaboration between the two countries in the exchange of intelligence. The Ivorian president said he was encouraged by the ongoing reconciliation efforts in Burkina Faso.
And in Somalia, the United Nations World Food Program is delivering life-saving assistance to more people than ever before, reaching 3.7 million people with relief and over 300,000 with nutrition support. But famine is now an imminent reality unless immediate and drastic action is taken. With a country gripped by a devastating drought and forecast of an unprecedented fifth consecutive failed rainy season, famine is now projected in several districts of the Bay region of Somalia from October to December unless resources can be secured to sustain and expand the scale up of humanitarian assistance. Famine in Somalia is closer than ever. It's an imminent reality if we do not act immediately. As WFP, we know from experience that we cannot, we cannot wait for a formal declaration of famine to act. So for months, we have been working to scale up our life-saving support in Somalia. We are reaching more people than we've ever had before. 3.7 million people with relief, and more than double the number that we have reached in April. Over 300,000 with nutrition support. Well, it's completely the opposite over in Chad, where the country's heaviest seasonal rainfall in over 30 years has left parts of the capital, N'Djamena, navigable only by boat. According to aid agencies and the state weather agency, the downpour has forced thousands to flee their flooded homes over the past month. Families have to pile into wooden boats to cross streets that have been awash with fetid flood water since the end of July. Floods are not uncommon during the Central African country's rainy season, which usually runs from May to October in its southern regions. But this time, the rains came early and were more abundant, quickly overwhelming drainage channels and ponds. According to Idris Abdallah Hassan, a senior official at the State Weather, Chad has not recorded such a quantity of rainwater since 1990, adding that entire towns found themselves underwater. Local authorities need to take responsibility and help our district build canals to evacuate water from the storm water management ponds. These ponds are full and water is overflowing into the houses. None of the district's neighborhoods were spared by the floods this year. It's really sad to see so many people suffering. According to latest figures from the UN Humanitarian Office, over 440,000 people across southern Chad have been affected by the floods this year. 41-year-old widow Caroline Mosedi says she and her four children had been sleeping rough at the school with no money for the past three weeks after their home collapsed in the flood. We are at the mercy of the mosquitoes. We have no food and some of us have malaria. Nobody is thinking of helping us. The authorities are looking at us from afar as if we were migrating birds. The government has set up an emergency crisis committee to help flood-affected people with food, blankets, and health kits. However, many residents staying at the local school say they are still waiting for government help. In recent years, intense rainfall, land degradation, and poor urban planning have led to more frequent flood disasters in West and Central Africa, whose countries are among the most vulnerable to climate change. Still to come on the program. Prison life slavery inspires a South African artist at the Contemporary Expo. That's in a moment. Please stay with us. Now, welcome back to the program. To politics now, the main opposition party in Angola, the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, has urged the Constitutional Court to hear its appeals and invalidate the declared election results that gave victory to President Yao Lorenko. Chairman and presidential candidates of UNITA 
Adalberto Costa Jr. says that discrepancies of over 500,000 votes changed the official results. The Angolan National Electoral Commission, in response to the petition, asked the Constitutional Court to reject the appeals lodged by the UNITA, Bloco Democratico, and the Casa uh, Coalition contesting the official results of the elections. However, Luca Quilundo, spokesman of the CNE, says his team had done their job correctly. Former Ivory Coast First Lady Simone Gbagbo said that her newly launched political party will focus on economic development and changing people's lives. Mrs. Gbagbo says it was necessary to address issues of reconciliation in a frank manner to allow people to heal, forgive, and continue living together in peace. She adds that she had met people from different ethnic groups who were still holding grudges, and it was necessary to address the issues to allow victims to start working on healing their hearts in order to achieve forgiveness. Alongside her husband, she faced accusations of crimes against humanity committed during the country's 2010 to 2011 post-election crisis following Mr. Gbagbo's refusal to step down from power. She also says that her party will make alliances with others in due course as it's impossible to do politics without alliances. Mrs. Gbagbo said that she believes it was time for a woman to lead the country, though the presidential elections are not due until 2025. And here in Nigeria, the Industrial Training Fund has taken over the management of the Lafia Vocational Institute. Governor Abdullahi Sule disclosed this when he visited the edifice, adding that takeoff funds have been approved to ensure speedy commencement of activities. Our correspondent, Hamilima Gayam, reports. The Vocational Institute Lafia was commissioned by President Muhammad Buhari in February 2022. Month after, Progress has been made to ensure its utilization through a partnership between the state government and the industrial training fund. On a visit to the institute, the governor receives a briefing from the ITF director in charge of the school. He inspects the various training workshops and states the commitment from the government side to ensure a smooth takeoff. ITF has already now accepted to take over because they have the right curriculum that should be applied and uh, they have now we have now signed the mou with itf and itf house has sent one of their executive directors to come and be the leader who will take over the management and we are working very strongly right now to give them i have approved their takeoff uh, grant you know so that they can have their resources and they can take off so that is the dream we have, and that is uh, so far where, where, where we have been. The school head gives an assurance to ensure due diligence. The recruitment in different media, we are going to use newspapers and radio and other means, uh, churches and mosques to let people know that this thing is about to take place. If they're interested, you apply. When you apply, we are going to get the best those who are ready for the program because we don't want people that will come today, you won't see them again till after two weeks. People that are committed, they were good to go. With the government's resolve to tackle youth restiveness, unemployment and insecurity, various skills comprising electrical installations, fitter and motor mechanics, mechatronics engineering, welding, fashion design and ICT among others are to be taught here with the management commencing with three programs to cater for skilled, unskilled youth and persons living with disabilities. Halima Gayam, Channels Television News. African leaders have criticized wealthy nations for failing to turn up at a climate change summit in the Netherlands. The only Western leader to appear in person was the Dutch host, Prime Minister Mark Rutte. The Senegalese president, Macky Sall, says he felt bitter that the world's main polluters had failed to offer funds to, Afri to help Africa adapt to global warming. His Congolese counterpart also said the continent contributed the least to climate change but is suffering its worst consequences. The Horn of Africa is enduring its worst drought in four decades and several countries are on the brink of famine. 
Zambia plans on holding detailed talks with China and other creditors as it tries to rebuild its economy after defaulting on its foreign debts in 2020. The southern African country got a boost on its financial fortunes after securing a $1.3 billion IMF bailout last week. According to the finance minister, Situmbeko Musotowani, the IMF loan is necessary to help us get out of the debt quagmire. He adds that the country is going into detailed negotiations with all the creditors, including China, to reduce the level of indebtedness and resume debt servicing. The Washington-based IMF says the bailout package will help re-establish sustainability through fiscal adjustment and debt restructuring. The loan agreement includes passing of a new law that will make it harder for any future government to borrow in a reckless manner. And in the world of art, uh, many South African artists are inspired by their life experiences. A leading contemporary art exhibition in Johannesburg saw a number of South Africans displaying pieces that was birthed out of prison time and slavery. Take a look. South African artist Blessing Gobeni first picked up a paintbrush during a nine-year stint in prison, drawing fellow inmates and birthday cards to kill time. At his downtown Joburg studio, Ngobeni makes his paint that he'll use for his next body of work to be exhibited in London next year. I was sentenced to nine years in prison and then I stayed uh, in prison for those years. Then that's where I discovered that, oh, there's something. And though it was more of like killing of time, it wasn't like something that I was sure of. I was like, ah, let me just push my time and kill the time by drawing uh, other inmates' portraits and designing birthday cards and writing messages. The 35-year-old showcases work at South Africa's FNB Art Joburg Fair, a leading contemporary art exhibition featuring artists from across the continent, back in full swing after a two-year pause linked to the pandemic. His latest body of work, titled Spirit of Water Dancing, was displayed in front of colorful canvases with a painted set of antique armchairs and sofas, inspired by an eerie discovery in 2016 of a chair in North Georgia allegedly stuffed with the hair of black slaves. I recreated the same story uh, using uh, the same coaches, you know, uh, printed the, my work in these coaches and stuff, stuff uh, in things that are very secretive to the people. But what I looked at also there, the beauty of these things that we, we have, these things that we own, lies uh, a secret, uh, lies DNA, lies memories, lies pain of the other people. The art fair has pioneered Pan-Africanism since inception, and this year featured exhibitions from galleries across Africa, including Zimbabwe, Botswana, Ghana, Uganda, and Nigeria. What's exciting about the group of artists um, that the continent has is the vibrancy, and the, they're very different. Um, the materials they're using, the storytelling behind their work is very different to what you find in Europe or in the U.S. Nigerian art curator and founder of Paces Gallery in Lagos, Wunika Muken, who was also exhibiting at the fair, told news agencies that the diversity of African art was inspiring to see. There's a lot of figurative art that's going on in West Africa, so a lot of artists are, are making works with, you know, black faces, black portraiture, black poses, and so coming here and seeing a lot of, you know, abstract works and, and sculptures has also been very refreshing. The fair also had other famed artists who showcased their work and various initiatives across the city, such as Open Art, a program focusing on public art and installations in unexpected areas. Well, that's Network Africa today. Thank you for watching. I'm Jocker Rogers.